on the bottom on the glass tab of your um, Excel spreadsheet. You have a table 2A-3A top and bottom. Okay, one's for skylight. That's the bottom. We're not going to worry about that unless you have skylights. The top one is the one I'm worried about. Okay, in the white, you need to enter the um, type of construction. Okay, in other words, the first the first line I have. Okay, three pane, low E with metal frame. Okay, that's what the majority of my windows are in the house. Doesn't matter if they're in the bedroom, doesn't matter if they're elsewhere. Okay, I'm looking for what the overall windows are. So if you have some with double pane, you have some with single pane, you have, you'd list the different types out, not by room on this one. Okay, then you have to go to your table, um, table 2A and 3A, which I've given you. Okay, T3, you'd have, and T2, okay, you would find, for example, number three double pane window, metal frame, okay, you'll find the U value for those. Now, you could also use the heat, the BTUs per square foot, but remember what you have to do for that, because that's, um, this is basically BTU, so you have to back into the formula. Don't do that. Use the U value. Before you get too far on this, I was having trouble opening the uh, Excel worksheet in Excel. It says it's password protected. Did you get the new one that I just re-put out there on um, end of last week? Is it on a different module? Because um, I fixed that. I unpassword protected everything. I only saw one, but I don't know. I think I thought I replay. I thought I posted another one that said unpassword protected or something. Hang on. Oh yeah, is it this file below the iPad, the sheets? Yeah. Are... Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, I'm, I fixed that after you guys let me know about that. Oh, okay. Sorry, I hadn't seen that yet. I was trying to input stuff onto that, and it wouldn't let me. Oh, it won't even let you open it. It seems to be a bug in Office on iPad. Okay, so back to my glass sheet. Okay, so what you're doing here is for this type of window, at this point you're not worried about any windows or anything like that. You're entering the U value, and then you're entering the cooling HTM from the table from table three. Okay, based on what type of glass you have. Okay, so example, again, double pane, okay, double pane plate, okay, low E coating. Okay, you're using basically the values, and this was in my second line, okay, 13, 15, based on directions. Okay, again, David, at this point, we are not worried about um, individual windows. Okay, I'm just worried about construction on the glass tab. Right, that's under the regular glass tab, not the schedule. That's correct, okay. And then you go over to the doors, which is the yellow, which is the yellow sheet. Again, if you scroll down, okay, on the doors, on table two, Okay, you can find, um, actually, number 11 is like solid metal doors. Okay, so your table 2, the file MJ-T2, has the door information in it you need. Okay, so for example, my front door, okay, is a, a metal door with polystyrene core and storm. Okay, find that on table two. It's actually number, under number 11 on table two. And you find a heat load over on the right-hand side of 0. .317. Okay, that's what you uh, it, it, wait, wait, wait a minute, yours, yours is 317? 0. .317. 
Yeah, I uh, okay. Mine mine's the same thing, but I don't have a storm door, and I thought mine said point three one seven. Um, so you just it, have the polystyrene core. I have the metal door frame, wood frame, polystyrene. I've got uh, the the uh, point uh, three one seven. My front door and my gar- and the door going into the garage. My two front facing exterior doors are that. My French doors are under the windows. But, you know, because of the amount of glass, my only problem is that when I go to the schedule, I have one more window door to, than the lines I have to fit the individuals on the schedule. Okay, hang on, hang on. Let me get to the schedule. Let me finish this first, okay? Then we'll yep. get to the schedule. Okay, so that's weird because on if you look at table two, Again, when you look down there, if it's just polystyrene core, okay, on that door, I'm getting a point four seven zero. Yeah, then I read it wrong. Okay, I'll, yeah, I'll, con- I'll confirm it again. Yeah, just double check that. Okay, so that is the door. And again, you're worried about door types. I'm not worried about individuals at this point. So then... The next place I go is the glass schedule, which becomes into my green tabs. Okay? Now, here is where you're not, again, you're not worried about individuals. You're worried about types based on direction. Okay? So, for example, I started off with my French doors, which is low E glass. Okay, I happen to have two of them, but they're facing north. Okay, so I could put them on one line. So my line number one is my French doors. Okay, and again, base. if you click on that yellow, you can see a drop-down list of what you chose on the prior screen. Okay, what you filled out on the glass individual tab. Okay, so I'm not worried about each window listed individually or each French door listed individually. I'm worried about direction. So if I have four French doors facing north on my house, okay, they it's just one line. If I have a bunch of windows facing east, okay, it's just one line. So I'm okay, worried but about, am I but am I supposed to but am I supposed to multiply the net square foot? By not the number this, of windows? Not in this page yet. Okay. Because you don't see anything here with square feet, right? We're just saying height of opening and distance by of overhang. I don't know if you remember uh, last, last Friday I talked about um, overhang the roof, okay? So how far out does the roof ledge go over that window? Right. Now, now if, I'm doing, if I'm in a second floor house and I'm doing the first floor, I only have an overhang with the wraparound porch on the front of my house. The rest of the house, the only overhang in the back is about a foot. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm the first floor. That foot is 10 feet, 12 feet above. Honestly, I, I have, a, like, I have a walk-in attic. Would I even put it? I would do like I did line number two. Okay, zero and zero, quite honestly. You, you got it. Okay, because 10 feet up, one foot out, that ain't going to make a bit of difference. Okay. understand. So, again, don't do individual windows here. Do based on type and direction. So, if you have relatively new construction and if you have on a second or first floor of a building, if you have four directions your windows are at, okay, you're probably going to have one line for each direction. Okay, and again with the doors, depending on how many doors you have. If you that get into sense. a cir- if you get into a circumstance where you have more than twelve, email me separately, and we'll figure out how to. I have to play around with the sheet, okay? So just just I hope that helps that. Any other questions from anybody on the call regarding the glass schedule, doors, glass? Uh, I'm just still having some trouble with the spreadsheet itself, being able to enter any values. Where are you trying to enter values? 
Well, you were just following along with the door and glass section there. It won't let me enter anything in there. Where it won't let you enter on the white? On these yellow tabs at the bottom? Okay, so if you go to the yellow tab, go to door. Yeah. And click on one of the light white lines. Yeah, it boxes out in green, but I can't see. Okay, when it boxes in green, click on the, go up to that top ne next to the FX, right where my cursor is right now. I'm sorry, I can't see where your cursor is. Right on your Excel spreadsheet, do you see the, there's the line at the top. It's next to, there's a little, on the right of it, there's a red X and a check mark. Yes. You can type in there. In this FX box? Yes. It's not letting me type in there. Did you click in it? Yeah, I'm trying. It just stays highlighted green on this box. It Mine tells me I can't change anything. If you're clicked on the white, so if you click on a white. No, I'm clicking hey. on yellow and blue and everything. Are you guys signed into Microsoft Office? Oh, yeah, that was the other thing. Did you guys sign in? I don't know yeah. how we downloaded Excel a long time ago, but I don't know if we ever signed in. It should give you an option up in the right-hand corner to sign in. Um, and then you'll be able to unedit it. Um, yeah, that's if you exit that sheet like I just did, okay, and go to settings. Okay, so on your main screen, you have settings down in the bottom left. Yeah, I see that. Okay, go to account. Yeah, it looks like I'm logged in there. Yep, I'm logged in. Um... It also wouldn't let me save a copy of this file at all. That is but, weird. Yeah, I don't know. Can you log? Can you try when you get a chance log out and log back in? Do, don't do it now because I don't want you to lose sight of where the sheet where the sheet is. But could you? Um, yeah, I'll try it. I'm I'm gonna try to pull the thing into Excel again, but. It actually gives me a weird error message at the beginning, too, when it loads up. It says something about circular reference. Oh, yeah, don't no, just accept that. That's fine. Okay, because when I went into, I forget what it was, summary, I don't know what it looks like on your end, but the heat loss and heat gain and everything else under summary are filled in with these weird... These signs, like I have on my screen, I don't know if you can some see Some of them, now. but I have even more. Those are just the formulas that have nothing in them right now. Yeah, they're just formulas that haven't been filled out yet. Okay, but I, it doesn't seem like I have the same, I guess, oh, okay, I guess I see what you're saying. As you put the rooms in or the windows yeah, in. Yeah, as you start filling stuff in, they'll fill out, the rest oh, of it will fill out. I thought fields might have just had some weird stuff in them, been a little off. Yeah, I'm using the same file you guys are using, so... Um, <laughs> Read only at the top. And then what when is I, that? Yeah, it says read only version at the top. And then when I click to save a copy, it tells me Office 365 feature, get a subscription. But I am logged okay. in. Okay. Yeah, do me a favor. Log out and log back in. All right. Let's see if I can hopefully I remember the password. <laughs> okay. Is it okay if I continue on while you're doing that? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. I want to make sure you're okay, but let, let me make sure we continue on at the same time. Yeah, do you think? Okay. So um, then you're going to get over to the glass schedule. We talked about that. Okay. That's all said and done. Now you go to the J1 form. Okay, all of the glass and windows that you have entered on the um, J1 form, okay, or on your glass and door schedules will now be showing up under the blue, under windows and glass doors, okay? They'll all be showing up there. Walls, okay, is another tab in the yellow down at the bottom, okay? So what you're going to do is you're going to look at your outside walls, Okay, and again with table two, 
find the closest outside wall that you can find. Okay, and you're going to come over and find the U value of that outside wall. Now, don't go crazy with it. You guys are not, um, you guys are not contractors. I don't expect you to tear walls apart. Try to come close. The other thing that you can do is use, I gave you a sheet that was R values of common building materials. Okay, feel free to use that. There's just one problem. This gives you R values. You need to have the U values. Does everybody remember how to find the U values from an R value? Don't you take the R value and divide it into one? That's correct. R value right into one. So U equals one divided by R. It's the reciprocal formula. Don't go nuts with decimal places. Take it out to like two or three. Probably three is a good idea. Okay, if you've got a whole bunch of decimal places, just round it to three decimal places. Make sense? When we're doing a wall, like, like for instance, I have two walls I have to work with. I have one that is sheetrock, then it's uh, uh, two by six with R19, then I've got sheathing on the outside and I have siding. The other one is sheetrock, two by six, R19 insulation, sheathing, and then brick. So all I'm doing is looking for all five of those things, adding it up, and that's my wall. Yeah, and sometimes on table four, two, you might actually be able to find that or come very close. Okay, because if you, like, look at table two, okay, you might come relatively close. Chris, we can't see your screen if you're uh, trying to share it. Better? Yep, thank you. Okay, guys, my screen is going to be a little bit slow updating. Tell me if you cannot see it because I'm on a cell phone connect all of a sudden. So, um, okay. So, again, heat and cool work or R values of common building materials, use it. This is the one I tried to show you a minute ago. Um, gives you the ability to most of the building materials here. But J2, which is the table 2, um, if this was what I was trying to show you, was you might actually find the wall types in this. This is a pretty big table, and most construction seems to be here. Where do you have that okay. uh, uh, file? So that file was on it it's in our course and i put it on oh let me see if i can resurrect that window it was down near the bottom on the modules yeah it's on it's on the modules and i uploaded all of the manual j i think it was in the heat load module if i'm remembering um might have been in the heat loss one yeah it's in the heat loss module i have all of the heat load tables right there is gypsum technically sheetrock i would consider it sheetrock yeah that's uh, that's what i've always looked this, at it with this is an old list isn't it it's a 2000 this one's a 2016. i'm sh shocked they use gypsum uh, that's yeah it's 2016. Um, ACA doesn't update all that frequently. Okay. So any other questions on this? You're going to do, again, you're going to do the same thing for the walls, the ceilings, and the floors. Okay. Now, in the notes for assignment four, for part four, I did put, if you're only doing the first floor of your house, you have two-story houses, I want you to get an idea of what the heat load is under an attic. So for the purposes of our exercise, if you're ignoring the second floor, please ignore the second floor and the ceiling of your second floor consider it being under attic, okay? Again, just for the purpose of our exercise, once you do this, you can always go back and change it later. So if you're ignoring the second floor, 
Okay, because you because I told you it was fine to do. Okay, if you have two story house, you're ignoring the second floor. Just go ahead and use the ceiling as under attic. Okay, because that way we get a decent heat load, and we're going to talk about duct loss. And I want you to have an understanding of the duct loss. Are we ignoring the fact that we have a heated basement as well for the floor? No, no, I I would not ignore that. Okay, I because that way your floor doesn't have any heat loss. Right. Okay, and I think I'm I'm pretty sure I gave directions on that as well. Um just Yeah, I put that in there. If you have an unheated basement under your flat first floor, the floors are considered exposed over an unheated basement. If basement is heated, they do not need to be included, so you can use a zero BTU per hour for those. Okay. Make sense? Yep. Okay. Dave, if you're still on the line, do you have the – did you guys get the table two? We got the table one and two a while ago. We got three and four Friday night, um, and I've been doing this on my laptop. I can't stand touch screen, so I have had no problem getting in and out because I have Excel on okay. on my laptop. So. Okay. Just wanted to make sure you had the tables you needed. Yeah, yeah. That, okay. I'm, I'm actually – I have most of this done. My problem, my problem was trying to figure out, like, when I'm in that schedule, you know, now I know that I'm only supposed to put the, the you know, whether it's north, south, west, whatever, uh, put the information in. Uh, I was trying to figure out where I was putting, you know, each and every individual window. Okay. Okay. So that's where I want to uh, move on to today's material, folks. Uh, so if nobody else has any questions on the Excel spreadsheet, I'm going to go ahead and move on to our conversation about airflow and um, ventilation. Okay, and again, if somebody, if some, if I lose you guys or someone, please somebody um, email me or something because it doesn't always come up and say that I lost you. So that's it's sort of a problem we have with with all of these meeting services. They're not nice about that. So, um, and I will post the handouts for these powerpoints later. This is where we left off. Okay, we said typical values of airflow range from 0.5 for new construction to 1.0 changes per hour for older leaky buildings. Okay, that is where I left off. Now, this becomes very important with heating and cooling loads because of uh, the humidity and the cold air that comes in. Okay, the first thing, though, we have to deal with is ventilation because ventilation is going to be part of your heat load. Okay, ventilation is a way to control condensation by exchanging moisture-laden air with less moist air. Okay, that's one thing we can do, okay? But again, ventilation, remember I said it earlier in the course, the solution to pollution is dilution. In other words, if I have polluted indoor environment, and if I have a lot of humidity, a lot of carbon dioxide, a lot of um, VOCs, okay, you're going to want to bring in outside air to break that up. Okay, the problem is when you bring in outside air, you have a chance of bringing in polluted outside air or more humid outside air. So this has to be done carefully. Adequate ventilation is fundamental to the health and comfort of the people in the building. Okay, proper ventilation includes sealing the building envelope to reduce uncontrolled air leakage and ensure that all ventilation efforts Okay, complement rather than sabotage each other. What this means is I want to seal those cracks and crevices so I can choose what air to bring in, I can choose what to ventilate, and I can filter and condition the air exchanges that I'm making. The worst thing you can do is just bring in outside air and not filter and, uh, and um, heat or cool it because then people become uncomfortable and sick. Okay, if you think about what's inside a wall that's been built for 20 years, or in some cases 50 years, I'm not sure I want to be breathing in the air that's coming in through the cracks and crevices. 
because you have a real chance of having some major pollutants in there. Infiltration is the unintentional and uncontrolled flow of air through cracks and leaks in the building envelope. Yeah, that picture, lots of infiltration. Okay, looks like the ghost house. But, okay, it's uncontrolled. Ventilation is controlled. We have two primary forms of ventilation. We have natural and we have mechanical. And I talked about this earlier in this course. Okay, two forms of vent ventilation. Most residences rely exclusively on infiltration and natural ventilation strategies. The main drawback is the lack of control. Okay, now building code has changed. We now have energy code. We now have international residential construction code. Okay, IRC. Okay, we have um, energy conservation code, which is put out by the International Code Council. We now have to appeal to all these different codes. Okay, if you have unreliable driving forces, it can result in periods of inadequate ventilation followed by periods of overventilation. Okay, what do I mean by a driving force? Anybody? What do I mean by a driving force? Guys, are you still with me? What do I mean fans? by a driving force? Wind. What was that? Wind or fans? Well, for natural ventilation, yeah, wind is my most unreliable driving force we can possibly have. Okay, wind on one side of the house will push um, things through. Wind on the other side of the house will change that direction. Remember that diagram I showed you on when we were talking about pressures. Okay, different air pressures is caused by wind, and this can cause overventilation, which can cause excessive energy use. Mechanical ventilation systems are the exact opposite. I can provide a controlled rate of air exchange. Should my house be a positive or a negative pressure, or any building, should it be positive or negative pressures? Positive. Yeah, I want my house at a positive pressure because I want to keep a slightly higher pressure. Now, I'm not saying blow it up like a balloon, but I want to keep a slightly higher pressure in the house because it keeps all those exterior contaminants out and all my exhaust fans will work properly. Okay, if I open the front door and I feel air rushing into a house, that's not a good thing. It tells me we have some significant leakage going on. Okay, if I open up the front door and I feel a little bit of air coming out of the house, that's usually a good sign. Okay, too little ventilation will result in poor indoor air quality, while too much insulation can cause unnecessarily higher heating and cooling loads. So there's a happy medium there, okay? I want to make sure my occupants are safe, healthy, and comfortable, but I don't want to cause them to have $400 a month power bills or gas bills, depending on what part of the country you're in. Typical ventilation design is based on each controlled space's need by volume or occupancy. Okay, again, by volume or occupancy, number of people in the space or the volume of the space. The need increases when airborne pollutants are prevalent. Okay, for example, what we will have in your residence, okay, will be completely different than what we would have in a wood shop or a metal shop or a paper plant or even a restaurant. The needs change based on what's in the air. Okay, needs change with the amount of people in the building. Okay. And we, that's all set out by codes. Bathrooms and kitchens, they're the prime sources of indoor odor moist, and moisture. Okay, they're normally in windowless interior spaces and require mechanical exhaust. Okay, this is in more in commercial buildings, you'll find the kitchens in internal spaces. Okay, in residences, most kitchens do have a window someplace, but opening a window does not necessarily provide the required exhaust. So we require mechanical exhaust ventilation. Okay? 
A good ventilation system Min provides minimal impurities or pollutants, comfortable temperatures, and low flow rate with reduced noise. Okay, the lower the air exchange rate, the less noise I'm going to have. I keep coming back to this. Homeowners and business owners these days hate noise. Okay, there's a lot of people who are very sensitive to repetitive noises. Okay, so something tapping, a fan running, or something like that can cause a lot of problems. If you're, if you're designing a place, I mean, as opposed to just moving into something that exists, but if you're designing a place, can't you go slightly larger on the ductwork to get a little bit more uh, air exchange with less sound? Absolutely. Okay. What we are calculating out when we do ductwork design is the minimum. I can drop the static pressure by going to a slightly larger piece of ductwork, and I can actually drop my flow rates, drop my velocity, which is the feet per minute, and as long as I have enough velocity to get it out of the register ducts, I mean, I don't want to go too, hu I don't want to go humongous, but absolutely, we can drop those static pressures, we can cause less noise, and we can actually cause the system to work a little bit more efficiently, but what's the trade-off? When you're thinking about that, what's the trade-off by doing that? Well, you're going to have to have larger registers, larger vents. You're going to take up more space, and it's probably going to cost a little bit more money. That's right there, the cost. Okay? That's why, again, when we do these designs, we're designing to the minimum. But can I, can I drop it? Yeah. I work for a contractor who would not allow me to install a supply or return register that had a static pressure greater than 0.06 because he was very, very, very um, feeling about noises and stuff like that. Okay, so all depends on the contractor, all depends on how high of grade construction you want to go. We want to make sure we provide ventilation air to each room through mechanical and natural air distribution. Now, this was something I came across um, when I was doing some insurance claims up in Panama City Beach last year. Um, this is basically a floor plan, a part of a house. Actually, it was a remodeled garage that was now a kid's bedroom. Okay, and this actually was sort of scary. Um, so this over here was the bedroom area and pardon my drawings as you guys know my drawings suck okay back here we had an oil furnace we had our washer and dryer over here we had an oil hot water heater right here there was no windows in this room no windows just block outside wall block construction stone construction in the door of this room, there was a tiny little grill, like maybe a 10 by 12 inch grill, okay? And they were wondering, they were trying to blame this on the hurricane, but they were concerned that their daughter kept getting sick. Their daughter had been hospitalized. This was a seven-year-old kid had been hospitalized two or three times over the last year with flu-like symptoms, just feeling really, really sick, emergency room visits, bad heartbeats, and stuff like that. Can anybody tell me what the problem was? CO2 anybody? by carbon. It sounds like too much carbon dioxide. Yeah, whoever said CO2. Yeah, CO2. Um, both of you guys, correct answer. There was no ventilation in this area here, and even worse, there was no ventilation in a ha habitable room. This was an old garage. No one had ever designed it to be a space that someone was living in, much less a kid. So when they built this wall around the mechanical room, they didn't take into account there was no air for these appliances to come into here. So again, this comes to the importance of ventilation. Now, did they ever pull a building permit on this space? No. 
Okay, this was totally unpermitted. So this was just, and again, this is coming to when your guys are going out there in the field and starting to work in the field. This is why we do this course, so you guys can start recognizing issues like ventilation, air distribution, okay? So we have to provide ventilation air in one way or another. Okay, ventilation air is used to provide acceptable indoor air quality. Residential buildings, again, have notoriously relied on opening a window for outdoor air. That's a really bad idea. And these days, it's not acceptable. It's against code. We want to be using heat recovery ventilators, okay, for the most part, or just air intakes from the outside into a return duct of a forced air system. Okay, so a heat recovery ventilator reclaims energy from the exhaust airflow by using a heat exchanger to heat or cool the incoming air. And it's about the newer ones are very close to 80% efficient. Okay, so what it does, it's sort of a, it's sort of a two-sided piece of cardboard it goes across where the exhaust air goes out through a pattern and the intake air comes in through another pattern. And as the two go on each side of the cardboard, there's a heat exchange that happens. The air coming in warms up, the air going out cools down. We also have ERVs called energy recovery ventilators, which exchange moisture between the two air streams as well. They're called ERVs. Okay, in your area of the country, most of the air exchangers you will see installed are HRVs. However, as climates are warming, believe or not believe, but as things are changing, you guys are going to start going to ERVs because your air conditioning longer and longer each year. Okay, so ERVs, if you have a very humid environment, if you're air conditioning most often, we use ERVs. If you're heating most often, we use HRVs. The difference is ERVs do moisture exchange. Okay, they exchange that latent heat. HRVs just exchange sensible heat. Okay, so again, two types of ventilation, natural and forced. Okay, back in the days of the early factory factories, everything was just used natural ventilation. They opened, they opened up here at the top, they opened windows that opened up and down, and all the heat from the factory floors just went straight up, and, he, and they opened the windows on the side, so it created the natural air current that was coming in the windows and up. The problem is that any of these old pictures you look at, part of it is just because of the picture, but it always looks dusty. Even if you get a really clean image that's not been blown up 20 times, okay, it always looks dusty, and that's because there was a lot of dust in the air in these buildings. Okay, and again, an older factory. All of these windows up here opened up to allow ventilation to come in through the bottom, okay, and sometimes even through grates in the walls and just naturally circulate up. It's what we call stack effect. Cool air from the lower goes up and pushes the hot air out the top. To control comfort level, it's necessary to control the rate and the location of the ventilation air entering the buildings. Okay, even more important is the flow of outside air is diluting the contaminants inside the building. A minimum outside supply per person for any type of space is 15 CFM. I gave you this number once before. The minimum outside air supply per person for any type of space is 15 CFM. The minimum rate, this minimum rate maintains the carbon dioxide below 0.1%, which is 1,000 parts per million. Again, I'm worried about carbon dioxide a lot of times in an indoor environment. This is the air you breathe out. It's part of what you exhale, okay? You exhale carbon dioxide. 
So this 15 CFM is a very important number. Now, how can I tell in a commercial building if my, if my ventilation is not right? Tell me one thing I can look at if my ventilate to check ventilation in a commercial building. Anybody? You can check uh, CO2 levels. You could also check for uh, possible moisture issues. Yeah, CO2 levels is what we actually use. In most of our commercial building controls, okay, CO2 levels are what I look at. So I have sensors around the building in commercial buildings. And if my CO2 level, if my carbon dioxide levels come up to 0.1%, or even some of them go to point to allow to 0.2%, which I don't buy. I can turn on ventilation. I can open up outdoor air intakes. I can open up exhaust intakes. And I can forcefully ventilate the space. So building control systems are using the carbon dioxide concentration to see, do I need to bring in more or less outside air? For manufacturing areas, do they have sensors for particulates uh, count in the air? Yes. They should. Okay, now it depends on when it was built. If it was built before, I, I want to say, and again, this, the exact year is a little bit different per state, but most often it was built before 1996. They might not have to until they upgrade the systems, until they retrofit. After 1996, most states went to the International Building Code, which requires it. And believe it or not, the National Fire Protection C, okay, um, NFPA code, actually had some pretty stringent particulate counts for paper plants and anything with coal and mineral processing. Okay, and I think lumber mills also, if I remember right. I'd have to go back and check that one. But I think because those are explosive hazards. Okay, infiltration loss. Remember, I keep coming back to this. Infiltration losses is energy required to warm outdoor air leaking in through cracks and crevices around doors and windows or through open doors and windows. Okay, infiltration keeps coming back to the uncontrolled movement of air in or out of a building. Okay, it's uncontrolled. Well, the loss is, again, immeasurable in BTUs per hour. Okay, how much energy do I have to retake to heat or cool that air that is coming in or out of the building? Okay, examples, cracks and openings in the envelope. Remember that brick wall that I keep showing you guys? okay, that had that big old crack in it because the house settled. That's an example of infiltration loss. Cracks or openings in envelopes. Baths and kitchen vents. Okay, yeah, they have, um, they have a fan in them, but what happens if the wind is blowing outside? What happens if my house becomes depressurized? Okay, there's still movement of air in them because there's no mechanical damper in them shutting them down. Fireplace chimneys. Okay, if you guys have a fire in a fireplace on a cold winter night and then forget to close the damper the next day, that is the biggest loss of heat you're ever going to have, okay, because all the warm air from the building is just going to go up the chimney. I've said, it, I've said this before, maybe not to this group, but chimneys are stupid. They don't, need, they don't know if they're supposed to be working or not. They're going to work until you tell them not to by closing a damper. They also don't know if they're supposed to be pulling air out or pushing air in. It's all based on the stack effect. In other words, is it warm air or is it cold air? Is the building pressurized or is the building depressurized? So again, all of this is infiltration. Infiltration is the single cause of heat loss in a residential building. Okay, the greatest single cause of heat loss is infiltration. Two main forces, prevailing wind, and natural draft. And, of course, there has to be leaks for this to happen. Prevailing winds. I've shown you this diagram before when we talked about pressures. Prevailing winds cause a high pressure on one side of the structure, okay? In other words, if I have my house here, okay, 
And if I have winds hitting this side of the house, okay, this side of the house is going to be a positive pressure. But as the winds come over the structure, this side of the house all of a sudden becomes a negative pressure. Okay, so I can pressurize one side of the house and depressurize another side of the house. Okay, if I have a chimney on this side of the house that's not up high enough over the roof line, I can actually cause the chimney to work either in reverse, depending on where it is, or the right way, or I can pull more air out of the outside. Wind is my greatest problem with infiltration. These two different pressures combine to force air into any opening on the upwind side and pull air out of the building on the downwind side. Okay, so again, if I have rooms in this house, okay, there's rooms in here. This room could be a positive pressure. This room is suddenly a negative pressure. Okay, my attic could be, depending on where the vents are, either positive or negative. Well, this can have really bad effects in the inside environment, okay? Exhausts don't work properly. You can blow air down a chimney instead of allowing it to come out of the building. When we talk about oil, okay, in a future term, okay, you guys are going to find out that we have draft issues, okay, that come into play. Furnaces don't draft properly a lot of times because of wind, So that's a natural draft. Hot air rises through the building and escapes through cracks and crevices in the top ceiling. Causes cold air outside to be drawn in. Okay, don't know why it said drain low, but should be drawn in. Okay, two methods to estimate infiltration have been developed. We use two methods. We use air exchange method and we use effective leakage area methods. Okay, again, these are all on your charts and they're on the spreadsheet. The air change method is the air filling the volume of the zone is assumed to be completely replaced with cold outside air in a fixed number of times per hour. Okay, so when you see ACH, okay, so if I see ACH equals like 3.0, Okay, that tells me that my air changes per hour is three. So if I have a room that requires three air changes per hour, that means that it's assuming that the volume of the air inside that room is being exchanged completely with outside air three times per hour. Very frequently seen in hospital operating rooms or clean rooms and stuff like that where we want minimum pollution as much outside air as possible but is filtered and is changed but don't they don't they have a a minimum residential uh exchange rate i was i was reading that earlier and i mean i, I the house i'm in was built by the Amish. it was well built but there's no air conditioning and the only heat is in i mean i put it in the basement but otherwise the only heat was in the first floor uh, for second floor, I think they just believe in friction. But um, the issue the issue I'm running into is if I do a calculation, unless these windows are really poorly built, I have nowhere near the air exchange uh, that, that, that that requirement has, I mean, uh, short of opening windows. Yeah, it's actually very interesting you say that because um, this is becoming a very frequent problem, not only with the house you're in that's extremely well built, some of the older houses, but also some of the newer construction. They originally said you can't have more than, the, you couldn't have more than like two air exchanges per hour. That was the original energy code when they first started looking at energy codes. People were getting sick. So now... Um, I'd have to look up exactly what Pennsylvania requires, okay? I haven't looked at the code to say what it requires exactly. This, there. Just, just keep in mind, this house is only 17 years old. Okay. But now we're looking at they want between 3 and 7, okay? Now, we do this with blower door tests. We can put in a blower door, and I'll, I'll probably I'll try to in the next week or so do a video on that because I have one here. But... Um, do a blower door test 
and we can tell you exactly what their exchanges per hour is in, a, in any structure. We can measure it. The problem is we're coming no place close to the minimum. Okay, so you have to put in outdoor ins a lot of times for new construction, and when you pull permits, you actually have to put in outdoor air exchanges for this exact reason, because a house doesn't, a well-built house doesn't come close to this. But is it necessary for the health of the people in the house? A lot of times, yes. Does that make sense? Well, didn't they used to say the older houses that were drafty were actually healthier than new ones that are so buttoned up tight? Exactly. Exactly. But then there was the energy code thing, okay? Then you started using, we started getting very worried about the amount of energy that was being used. Okay, the so other the method is infiltration. What was that? So the environmentalists are killing us? I wouldn't want to go that and say that far myself, but because there are some good things, but we'll leave that alone. That gets a little bit too political for where I want to go. <laughs> okay, so the other method we look at is the effective leakage area method. Okay, it's based on the leakage of various construction components used in residential and mechanic commercial buildings. Okay, to obtain the building's total leakage area, we multiply the overall dimensions or number of occurrences of each building component by the appropriate table entry. The sum of their resulting is the total building leakage. I personally think that this is a very bad method because there's too much math involved. But if you want to be more exact, you find the total leakage area. Now, the correct way to do it, okay, and again, I do have one of these here, and I'll try to do a video someplace soon on how this, on actually doing this, I'll post it. But how we figure this out, okay, blower door test. A building's envelope leakage can be measured with pressurization testing. What we do is we seal all exterior openings and then we depressurize the house using a fan in what we call a blower door assembly. Okay, this fan is actually pushing out. Okay, we're depressurizing the house. We know based on fan size and fan specifications how much air this fan at a certain speed will suck out. I can tell you how many CFMs this fan is moving out. We use pressure sensors along with some computerized controls and some measurement devices. We can tell you how much air this house is pulling in based on cracks and crevices and unsealed openings that we can't find. I could tell you if the house is leaking. I could tell you under natural occurrences how much air this is going to, house is going to bring in. And sometimes even new construction is, very, is actually very interesting. For example, one house that I went to and did probably a year ago, brand new upper construction house, okay, high-end house. The report came back out and said to the contractor, hey, the air leakage in this house is the equivalent of a 50-foot, 3-foot wide gap in an exterior wall. That's what, that's what the report said, okay, it was significant air leakage. Then I had another house that I went and did where it was, the report came out and said, okay, you guys have to put in some outside air intakes, okay? There has to be outside air. This house is way too tight. And it's, it was actually interesting because that house was a, um, one of the cookie cutter houses in a development. So the higher end construction actually had more gaps than the cookie cutter lower end construction. So it was just interesting, but this is a blower door test. Okay, they're really excellent. They have to now be done per residential construction code. Okay, you build a new house these days, you have to do a blower door test. Okay, pressure differentials. Okay, they have impact loads and they occur because of everything we just talked about with infiltration, wind directions, hot air rises, it finds cracks to come out. Cold air replaces the hot air by infiltration. Okay, so again, stratification causes pressure. 
Building tightness is extremely important. How well is uncontrolled ventilation handled? We have three types. We have average, good, and tight construction. Okay, it's the resistance of the building envelope to airflow. Okay, it's the air tightness of a building. The amount of air leakage in cubic feet per minute. That CFM at a specific pressure or an equivalent leakage area from lower door measurements. How tight is it? Rate of air exchange. It's the time in which a given enclosed space receives or exhausts a complete change of air. Okay, this is air changes per hour. This you're going to find on a lot of specifications for buildings. Okay, air changes per hour. A target air change per hour is 0.35. Now, does that meet energy code? No. Okay. If the target is, okay, per hour is 0.35, at this rate all the air change space gets replaced once every three hours. There's just a problem. This doesn't meet energy code. Okay, so again, there's a difference between what ACA and what all the experts say in terms of air tightness and what um, the energy codes do say. So just be aware of that. So if I put in outdoor ventilation, okay, if I put in that little HRV box with a pipe to the outside, okay, I'm going to set it for when I leave there, it's going to be set to meet energy code. But you better believe I'm going to tell the homeowner or the building occupant, hey, when, when this is all said and done, here's how you adjust this. And I would adjust it down to the point three. Okay. Any questions on that? Because, again, this is a difference between code and what recommendations are. Okay. Air tightness is affected by the airflow paths in the building. Again, Okay, if I have fireplaces, if I have open doors, if I have um, airflow paths, could be my air conditioning ductwork, my heating ductwork. That's all passive airflow. It's going to affect the air tightness of a building. Leaks, okay, within the intended airflow paths are two general types. You have leaks in spaces between attics and between floors and walls, okay? If you've ever done construction, you know that the floor spaces join to the walls. Okay, a lot of times you can actually have leakage between the floors and the interior cavities of the floor of the walls, and it will actually pull air up the walls. Then you also have leaks in the building envelope. Remember, building envelope is my outside area of the house. Okay, building envelope is my outside area between my conditioned and my unconditioned space is my building envelope. Leaks result a lot of times from architectural design choices, such as location of windows, balconies, elevators, lobbies, and materials used. Okay, elevator shafts in commercial buildings are big chimneys if they're not sealed properly. Okay, elevator shafts, big chimneys if they're not sealed properly. I've seen a couple of hotels with major problems because of this. Leaks can result from cracks and openings where different building materials come together. Okay, if I have two different building materials come together, like right there, there's leakage. I could have leakage right there. I could have leakage right there. Okay, anytime building materials come together, if they're not sealed, you can have leakage. Okay, elevator shafts, as I said, plumbing, okay, electrical wiring holes, garbage chutes that connect to the outside. Electrical wiring holes are famous for leaking. They put in conduits, very important. Connections between floors and rooms, okay. If you, have connect, if you have different floors, between the floors there's joists, okay? If those are not sealed properly against the walls, you can have leakage resulting. 
Okay, leakage sites provide pathways in which ventilated air unintentionally enters or leaves a ventilated space. Now, what type of construction is this? What are we seeing here? People with newer houses may not actually see this. What type of construction are we seeing? Anybody? I'm not sure yeah. of the official name of it, but it's just plaster over that those uh, one bys. Yes, yeah, plaster and lath. That's what it is. Yeah. Okay. These are known back here. Okay, should be insulation if it's an outside wall. A lot of times it's that sort of wool uh, blown in type or cellulose insulation. But the problem is that settles. If that insulation has all settled to the bottom of the wall, I now have air gaps in here around any cracks that's just allowing free flow of air. Those walls are going to be cold. The driving forces behind the volume of unintended airflow is temperature and pressure differentials. Okay, remember, air will always move from areas of higher temperature to areas of lower temperature. Again, air will always move from higher to lower temperatures. What about pressures? The same thing can apply. Air will always move from high pressure to low pressure. What about humidity? How does humidity move? Same way. Humidity moves from areas of high humidity to low humidity unless you seal it. Okay, excessive or insufficient infiltration or exfiltration okay, can result from the joint effort of all these components. Consequences of unintentional ventilation, wasted energy. That's the bottom line. Unintended, unintentional ventilation, wasted energy, and a decrease in occupant comfort or safety. Again, think about an older building with those walls, with all that insulation that has settled, probably grown mold over time. Um, Older attics a lot of times have bats. There might be mice around. It has nothing to do with what people are doing in the house. You can be as clean as possible in the house, but you could have things in these walls and everything else you don't know about. I don't want air to come into my space through those walls, okay, because that, again, is an occupant safety issue. Air tightness is based on the materials and the assembly of the materials, Anybody ever work watch Homes on Homes? Okay, the show on DIY or one of those stations. It's a very good show. Oh, it's an awesome show. But you but you see all of this stuff on the on those shows, and you're sitting there thinking, okay, yeah, that's why it's caused. Okay, combined, everything that the way the building is built gives the whole building air tightness value. Okay. Stack effect causes negative pressure at lower levels, positive pressure at upper levels. The reason we use revolving doors in high-rise buildings, they prevent the stack effect, okay, because you're only allowing a certain amount of air at a time instead of a door that just is constantly being held open. How does wind affect heat loads? Very easily. It's air penetration. We have floors and walls, okay? We have through materials. So we have foundation wall, wall window, walls and roofs, okay? All of these are connections. It's where two materials or two areas of construction come together. Through materials, unsealed concrete blocks, mortar joints. Remember the wall that was falling apart that I showed you? Okay, and then we have windows. Okay, glazing is the other name for windows, remember. Okay, I can have U factors at different air speeds. Okay, the more the, the U factors will climb for infiltration U factors with different wind speeds. Okay, something very important to realize. 
Wind speeds affect infiltration. Determining a building integrity is easy. As I told you, what's the first thing you do when you go out and look at a building for a heat load situation? You walk around the outside. That's what I really wanted to, when we originally did that discussion board where I had you guys upload pictures, okay, or it was the one actually with the assignment, I had you guys upload pictures. Okay, what I was trying to get at was I wanted you to start looking around with not the homeowner eye set, but the eye, the view of a contractor or a technician going and looking at a building. Okay, we do an inspection. It's visual. We could test also. We could do quantitative testing. We can look at quality for qualitative. Okay? And again, there's different charts and everything out there that give us the numbers we need. I'm not worried about these, okay, because we have the ACA charts that basically tell us most of it. Okay? Qualitative standards practices for air leaking site detection in buildings. You can look this up online if you have more interest. Okay, and I'll put this again. You'll get the handouts of this. Okay, hose spray testing for water integrity. Again, something you saw probably on homes on homes, but not something that I normally would do in somebody's house. I don't want to spray water in a house to try to find the cracks. It's not really what I want to do. Infrared scanning. Okay, I still swear by this one. I love infrared. It's probably one of the best things that has come out with the infrared cameras. I use it all the time. Okay, that's you can take on a hot day down here or a cooler day, or if I'm looking at the outside of a building when there's air conditioning running, I can find all my cracks and crevices with an infrared camera. Makes it easy. Can you use smoke pencil testing? Smoke pencil is basically a pencil that you put a flame to, light it up, or sometimes just take the cap off if it's chemical, and it will actually pull the smoke from the tip of a pencil-looking device towards the cracks and crevices or away from the cracks and crevices. shows air patterns. Tracer gas is same basic idea. will pull towards the cracks and crevices if you're doing it right. Pressurization, the blower door testing. All things I can actually test. Again, Chamber just means room by room pressurization and depressurization. I use depressurization more than anything else. When you're okay, when you're again, doing you use this. sorry when you're doing a test through a um, uh, you know a door somewhere. If you're in a room, you can close off the room, build up pressure, and 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 run it that way. But if you've got an open area. Uh, like my, my house, my dining room, living room, kitchen, and front hall are all one pretty much open, connected area. How do you do that kind of pressure test on the front and back door when they're in the same space? You're, you're doing it on the entire building envelope. So what you do is you close all the doors with the exception of the one that you have your fan in, and you close yeah. all outside windows, and you block all vents. Okay, and then I okay. So you're just pressurizing the whole. You're just pressurizing or depressurizing the whole the whole place. Yes, and I use depressurize more often. Okay. It, it shows me more. If I use a negative pressure, it actually works better for everything. Okay. Okay, and the one key on that is you clean out the fireplaces before you do that. I found out the hard way once. Well, doesn't that clean out the fireplace for you? Yeah, but usually not in the right direction. Okay, because all because the depressurization, if that chimney is open by accident, okay, if someone hasn't closed it, it pulls all the ash into the room. Okay, so I think that is where we are going to wrap up today. Does anybody have any questions on anything I'm I've 